applying uh, inverse operations to that all the time. And, uh, you know, I think that this is going to go pretty quickly for us today. So uh, we'll jump into inverse sections here. Just to remind you right here, page 34, 1 through 18 is going to be what you're responsible for. What is today? Wednesday? Let's try and shoot for Friday on that. That's not like a fair plan to you guys. Okay. So uh, inverse functions today. How about a volunteer to read my essential question? Anybody want to do that for me here first? Thanks, Aubrey. What is an inverse function and how do they apply to real life situations? Okay. Anybody in their own words want to describe to you what an inverse function is then? Say that again. I'm sorry, Tessa. Yeah, we're kind of doing the opposite of stuff here. So if I would say what's an inverse to addition, you would say subtraction. What's an inverse for division, you would say multiplication. So we want to kind of take a look at this here. So in order to answer this question up here, we first of all need to understand what functions have an inverse. Okay? There's going to be rules about functions being invertible or not. Secondly, we need to describe the meaning of a function and then describe if that meaning has uh, an inverse. So there are going to be real life situations that we talk about. Uh, graphs are going to be crucial for this. And then the last part, we want to look at writing inverse functions from what? Okay, so let's, let's work at this. This won't take too long to get through today, I don't think. Inverse functions. I want a volunteer to read that definition for me. means that f of d equal t means, how do I read this right here? f inverse of t. That little exponent of negative 1 right up there, that little exponent of negative 1 is read as f inverse of t is equal to what? d. d. So as an example, kids, if I said this, kind of put this in terms of, of function notation. If I said f of 3 equals 72, then that would mean that f inverse of 72 would map back to what? 3. Okay. Inverses are kind of like this. If there's a point 1 comma 7, if there's a point 1 comma 7 on the graph, what's the inverse or I'm sorry, what's the inverse of the point 1 comma 7? 7 comma 1. So what we're talking about is this. When I input 1, I get an output of 7. So if that has an inverse, and that would say if the inverse the input 7, you would get back to 1. What I'm getting at is this. If the point 1 comma 7 is on a function, and that function is invertible, then 7 comma 1 must lie on the inverse. So here, listen to what I say. Ready? 6 comma 22 is on a function that's invertible. The point. What point for sure is on the inverse graph? 6 comma 22, what's the point? 22 comma 6 would be on the inverse, okay? All right, so I think that we kind of understand this notation right here. When you see this notation right here, do you make this connection right here about what we're talking about then? Okay. Horizontal line test then is the test that we're going to use uh, to determine if something is a function. And a horizontal line test is used for graphs. It says a function that is invertible or I should say a function is invertible if a horizontal line passes through the graph of f of x at most how many times? One. I'm going to draw two graphs up here. You ready? La, la, la. La, la, la. I see that. I think waves. We should be on a beach right now. Okay, never mind. The snow is fine. You trip. No. Top function, bottom function. Which one's invertible and why? I'm here in bottom. I'm here in top. How do I think the top is a function? They're both. Up. They are functions. Here's the real question: Are they invertible? Are both invertible? Yeah. Which one's not invertible? Uh, Why not? Uh, yeah. If I draw a horizontal line through here, I'll do my best to draw a horizontal line through here. Does that horizontal line hit the graph at most once? That one horizontal line hit the graph at most once, or multiple times? And yeah, and this is what we would use. Now, if I drew horizontals for this graph down here, how many times does each horizontal cross my graph? So 
So I would say, is this invertible? No. This one here fails the horizontal line test. So whereas this one would do what? Twice. So it passes, right? Okay. So we'll talk about stuff in terms of graphs. Uh, we'll we'll want to list some things. If I say find an inverse, you better first of all make sure that the function is even and invertible, right? Is there any point to find an inverse if you can't find an inverse or if a function is not invertible? There's no point. We'll talk about that, okay? So let's look at some practical meanings of, of functions and their inverses, okay? Example one says interpreting practical meanings of functions and their inverses. And in the example, it says the price P of meat at the grocery store is a function of the weight W of the meat purchased. Assume P is equal to what? Right here, this is just saying my price is a function of what? Weight. Weight. Explain what the following quantities mean. Well, guys, if this is like F, 4 is like a W or a P in this. And then that would mean 38.96 is like a... When I say f of 4 is equal to 3896, what does that mean in practical terms given that situation up there? 4 times, no, 38 divided by 4 equals f of x. Well, not really, because this is function form. This isn't saying 4 times f. This is saying f of 4. So 4 pounds of, of meat is equal to 38 dollars and Okay, so you're saying this 4 is a, really a W value, and W is representative of what here, kids? Weight. Weight. And then this 38.96 is like a P, where P is representative of price. Maddie, say that again. 4 pounds of meat at the grocery store cost $38. Okay, so I can say 4 pounds of whatever this meat is. 4 pounds of meat. Costs how much? Now, that's great for that function that they give us. P is equal to F of W. But now take a look at part D, or the second one over there. What's that? Is this value in here a P value or a W value? Why is it P? Because it's an inverse. Okay, so there's a lot of ways I could write this that makes 7.3 W. What can I say about this example then? How would you make some kind of a statement about that information that's given there? $65 to get 7.3 pounds of meat. You could read it that way. You could say $65.22 would allow us to purchase 7.3 pounds of meat. Or could I also say 7.3 pounds of meat costs what again? Yeah, either way, okay? I'm going to go with the way Lake wrote it so we have like some alternative ways of writing these. So Lake, uh, you're saying one more time, please. $65.22 to get the seven pounds of meat. We'll buy 7.3 pounds of what? All right, very good. Oh, gosh, Parson, this is why you're not an English teacher. Yeah, Durka, Durka. Meat, M E A T. Hey, a butcher at a meat shop is six feet four inches tall. What does he weigh? That considered meat. Yes, he weighs meat. Is that considered um, the first one? Is that considered meat? Um. What would that be? Somebody run 38.96, divide that by 4. Tell me what that would be. 9. That would be over 10. 9.74 a pound. That's pretty good. A lot of places are like 9.99 a pound for beef. So, yeah, it's okay. It's, it's practical, I guess. So, good question. Hey, these two are practical meetings up here. Any, uh, any questions about these two parts right here? What if we're buying the West Pies and not meat? Well, the pies would cost $15 for any kind of fruit pie, but then anything that's like... Um, what about a pound? Oh, pounds? Geez, I don't know. Pounds? We're buying pies by the pound now? Yes. Lord. She made one the other day at Thanksgiving. It was a Snickers pie. It was so good. Oh, it was my like, God. Just, oh, 
Yeah. Yep. It was really good. It was really good. You know, this class is pretty small. Maybe if we're nice, maybe if we're nice and keep working hard, maybe I can, maybe I can beg her to make a couple and bring them into class. And when we get back from lunch, we'll have dessert someday on the work day. Yeah. We can send her a thing. You don't have to do that. <laughs> Listen, that's about the only way I can get some anymore for the pies to eat because she's always making them for people. And she never makes them for me anymore. She's always like, oh, this person wants it for Christmas and this person for Christmas. Oh, so we want them for our Christmas. Uh, we do, yeah. don't we? Okay. Hey, let's get through this example before we head off to lunch here. Tell her Lake will compliment her in person. This is, she'd probably be, um, She'd probably be thrilled to know that. <laughs> Example two talks about determining if functions are invertible. Now, guys, these are going to be, they're, they're not going to be just a general function that's given to you in terms of x and y. They're talking about real life situations right here. And it says decide whether or not this function would be an example of something that's invertible. Okay? My suggestion to you is when we have real life applications of this right here, this is what I'm going to suggest. You might want to think about sketching a graph. So when it says the following, kids, when it says decide whether or not the function is invertible, example A says f of t equals what, kids? The height of the ball thrown in the air t seconds after it is thrown. So we're comparing a height and what other unit? We're comparing a height to a time, okay? I take something up here and I start right here. What time is this pen in my hand right now? Zero. Really time zero. I throw it up, time starts to relax. It's going to go up to a certain point, but because gravity on Earth, what's going to happen? It's going to come back down. So here's the sketch I would make for this. I would say that my height, f of t in other words, is a function of time. Now kids, the way I have the pen in my hand right here, at time zero, the height is kind of above the ground right now, isn't it? Okay. Now, time is going to start ticking away. We're going to start moving right on the graph. And as I throw this up, what's going to happen to my height? Over time, it's going to increase. But it's going to get to a point that it's absolutely at its what? Peak. Peak. And then it's going to come back down. Keep in mind, is time staying the same or is it constantly changing. Okay, so we're measuring these heights over time. It gets to a peak and then eventually it's going to come back down to the what? Ground. It's going to hit the ground right here. Okay. Do you guys agree that this would be uh, a graph of all the y values and the time that elapsed from the time I threw this up to the time it came back down? Okay. Is that going to be an example of a function or a situation that's invertible or not? This example would not be invertible because after you've represented it graphically, what's going to happen to you? How are you going to prove that this is not invertible? Yeah, if we say, okay, here's a representation of what's really going on here graphically, you would say, well, here comes my horizontal line test. Is that a horizontal line test, pass or fail? This is an epic fail right here. Yeah, this one here is not invertible because... It's not invertible because it fails the horizontal line test. Here's the deal, kids. Let's just pretend that this is time two seconds, and maybe this is time six seconds right here. Here and here for this horizontal line. Let's say that the height is maybe 12 feet. Guys, at two seconds, what was the height? 12. At 6 seconds, what was the height? 12. So when I say, let's do the inverse of this, the question becomes, when the height was 12, what's the time? 2. 2. Uh -huh. Or it was also what else? Six. It can't be 2. Uh. There we go. I think it's recording, isn't it? Yep, we're good. Okay. So... We talked about this action right here, or this uh, situation. Not being invertible because it passed, or I'm sorry, it failed. Which test? 
Okay, I'm gonna volunteer to read B for me on this one right here. What's the real life example here that we're looking to see if it's invertible or not? gas or x gallons pumped at the gas station. So the cost is going to go on the y-axis. Number of gallons over here. Now guys, think of this. If I go to the gas station and pump zero gallons, what's my cost going to be? Zero dollars. Okay. The more gallons that I pump, what kind of uh, function are you going to have? Or what? It's going to be linear and it's always increasing. increasing. So unless you're, what's that? Called where you like suck out the gas? Siphon? Siphon, yeah, that'd be decreasing. Yeah, it would be, but we're not going to assume that. So, um, talk to me about horizontal line tests for this. Passes. Passes. So, is this an example uh, in real life of, or a situation in real life that would be an example of something that's invertible? Yes. By definition, yes. Okay. So, this would be an example that is invertible. So, we're going to say, how about yes, invertible. And what's our reasoning? Passes the I love it, guys. Yes, this is invertible. This is a horizontal line test. So anytime they give you some kind of practical application like this or real life application, what am I suggesting you do? Sketch. Yeah, sketch. Just make a sketch. What's going on here? And then once you see that graph, can't you easily visualize that that's invertible or not? Okay. Doable? All right. Questions up to that point? Any questions up to that point? Hey, okay. let's run. Slope of the line. Oh, and then we'll ask the silly question. So, I think I know where you're going. Yeah, cost per gallon, yep. Yep, right now I think, uh, what's well, about 232 right now per gallon around here? That sounds about right. I've had some friends uh, or some family come in from Texas over Thanksgiving. They said down there, you know, gas was at Thanksgiving time there, about like $1.84 per gallon. So, uh, that's pretty good. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on. Example three, let's get this figured out. Okay. Determining if functions are invertible and finding their inverses. Okay. First of all, we have to determine an inverse for the following functions, but we better figure out if they're what first. We better figure out if they're invertible first. So here's my suggestion. I think I think we should sketch these out, but I like sketches now where? Alright, so let's take a look at this first one. X to the third minus four. This graph, x to the third minus four, kids. Oh, let's see. Zero did look like this. Let's call it x to the third minus four. I'm going to zoom home on this. What do you think? Does that look invertible to you guys? Pass a horizontal line test? Yep. I think so, too. So first thing you need to check, is it even invertible? Is it going to pass that horizontal line test? And since this one passes the horizontal line test, we need to find an inverse function for this. Okay? So let's check it out. I'm going to first of all write down that this does pass the horizontal line test. Therefore, we can find an inverse of this. Now, any of you guys recall or know things about finding inverse functions? Here's what I'll tell you. First of all, replace f of x with y. Okay. I'm hearing some things that I think you're... Yeah, switch what and what around. Remember what we said earlier in the lesson? If the point 1 comma 7 is on a function that's invertible, then what must be on the inverse? It's kind of like taking x and y order and doing what? Out. So for finding inverses, you're going to do just that. You're going to take x and y and do what with them? And then once we've done that, we're going to work this until we get y to be all by itself. OK? 
Okay, so watch this quickly. What would I do to both sides here? First, to try and get YLO. I heard somebody say it, I just didn't catch it. Add four to both sides. So we're all agreeing that x plus four would equal y to the third here. Okay, next step then, how do you undo cubing of something? So if I cube root the left, I better cube root the right. So we end up with the cube root of x plus four equals my y value. So to put this back in inverse notation now, kids, I would probably simply say, well, this is f inverse of x equals the cube root of x plus 4. See? So kids, why did I press on and find an inverse here, first of all? Graphically, we looked at it, that's going to pass the horizontal line. It's therefore, for all values of x, they are going to be invertible, right? Switch the x and y around and do what? Solve for y, okay? Once you solve for y, that becomes your new inverse function, all right? Now, I'm going to come back to this here in a second, but let's do the same thing over here. Determine what, kids? Let's determine an inverse for this. Okay, no problem. Should we just start switching x and y around, or should we do something first? What kind of function is this going to be, kids? Isn't it 6x squared, kids? Minus what? Is that the function right there? 6x squared minus 3x plus 4? Plus 2. Plus 2, I'm sorry. Well, what do you guys think here? Can't, it's not invertible. What 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 happens here? Wait, what's the way to make it sideways again? You would have had y's in there instead of x's. Okay. So you would have had. Does make sense? Okay. Um. So what do you want to say here? Do I even need to look for an inverse here? Yeah, it's a horizontal line test. And once you fail a horizontal line test, just stop. You're done. It's not invertible. This one here fails. So what? Not invertible. Not invertible. That function is like trying to drive a convertible in winter. Not good. Would be like a drive. Doesn't you just take a shower? Probably will drive slow. What? Take a shower. Doesn't you just take a shower and limp at it? <laughs> and then you're going to go, your freeze. Freeze, you spike? Yeah. Oh. Get out. <laughs> My favorite is when you see the guys with big beards and there's icicle things. You know. Okay. Hey, I want to talk about this. I want to come back to this one right here. Okay. On the last page here, kids, you have the following. It says, in example three, the graph of the original and the inverse function were put into decimals. And my question is this. I'm just going to tell you right here. This was my original right here. This was... What was the function that we had on the original one? A. X to the third. Was it minus four kids? Mm -hmm. And then our inverse, and I should write f of x equals this. What do we get for the inverse on that, kids? Wasn't it the cube root of x plus four? Okay. And these two graphs, first of all, I want to point something out. Okay, one point that I know for sure was on this graph, what's this coordinate right here? Zero comma what? And then likewise right here, if zero negative four was part of the original, and then by rules of inverses, what point should have been on the graph of the inverse then? Okay, 
Okay, so if I count here, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, is negative 4, 0 part of that? So it holds true. So guys, I guess, are, are there any, what do you see visually here? What do you notice about these two graphs right here? Uh, how do I want to say it? There's some stuff that goes with perpendiculars here, and I'll show you that here in a second. Keep that idea, Lake, all right? It's sideways. Okay. What two variables are we always comparing with inverses? X and Y. We're always flipping it around. So what would happen if we looked at the line Y equals X, where X and Y are equal, okay? Guys, Y equals X is simply a line with a slope of what? one and a y-intercept would be. So here's what I want you guys to do. I want you to sketch a line that might look like this here. Um, <coughs> go up here to point five comma five, right up here, and then draw a line somewhat like this, maybe down here, where your slope is one. This line y equals x actually becomes the line of symmetry or line of reflection for the two, okay? And back to Lake's point right here, here's the deal. I'm going to draw this even in here. This would be kind of cool. Watch this. If I would draw a line from these two points right here, from point to point right here, kids, what's formed here? Oh, snap. How many diagonals are across here? to the line of reflection. Isn't there two diagonals of length here? One box, two box, as there is one box, two box here. You see that? Okay. Okay, this is like the perpendicular bisector of the two lines, if you will, or a perpendicular bisector, in other words, is kind of like your line of symmetry. So yes, to your point, you could have said that, okay? So, what do we notice here, kids? Here's what I think we should write down. Anytime we're dealing with uh, inverse functions, which line or what equation for a line is always going to represent your line of reflection? Y equals x. You could, see, if I gave you one graph, could you sketch? Could you sketch the reflection of this over y equals x? Yeah. Or you could just turn points around. If zero, negative four is a point. Well, negative four, zero has got to be a point. Okay. Uh, so here's, how do you want to word this, guys? Whoops, I don't want that tool. I want my pen. Hang on. Here's what I think we should write. I think we should write the line y equals x is the line of symmetry Oops. the line of symmetry for our original function f of x and what other function kids inverse of x so for f of x and f inverse of x y equals x is going to be the line of symmetry for f of x and f inverse of x right there okay So we can say functions that are inverses of each other are symmetric about the line y equals what? x. How do you feel about this? Any questions so far? Okay. I do believe I do believe this is the easiest section of the ones that we've looked at so far. 